Hi everyone, uh, welcome to session 6A, which is uh, smart cities, regions and buildings. And welcome to all the panelists today uh, and to all the attendees to Kadri. Um, it's uh, great to be here and um, pretty odd to be here as well. So uh, we need to get started. Um, so I believe there are 12 papers in this session and they cut across um, a broad range of topics and methods and a common theme that um, is running through all of these papers are the use of um, digital tools and computational methods, I believe to uncover new relationships um, or new understandings of cities and regions and their environmental interactions and by environmental, I also encompass um, the notion of social interactions um, in that term as well. And also this sense of trying to understand the implications um, of simulating uh, these interactions um, and, and a sense of trying to um, predict and better understand our impact, um, the impact of design on cities and our environments. What I'm also seeing in a lot of these papers is the growing um, embrace and use of machine learning methods um, to uh, better understand data and, and novel methods. So um, across these papers, uh, paper 106 explored gaming environments um, as an integrated environment for exploring interventions and opportunities. Uh, paper 108 also highlighted the value of um, integrated platforms for urban modelling and compared three different urban virtual modelling platforms that are currently on the market. Paper 190 also explored um, implications of intervening in urban systems and the potential of catalyzing uh, small disturbances or, or perturbations. Um, and the significance of that in, in uh, conceptualising urban systems as complex adaptive systems. In paper 386, um, simulations are developed as a way to address, again, this notion of externalities and, un and, and how to um, account for unintended consequences of design, which perhaps traditional practices are less able to account for. And I was really fascinated by the way uh, drone delivery corridors were modelled um, to analyse uh, their potential noise impacts. Um, papers such as um, papers, so I'm using the ID uh, as a quick way to identify the paper. Um, papers such as paper 276 and um, ID 354 both explored um, social media data as a way to reveal more about the diversity um, of urban areas and as a method, I guess, of informing um, contemporary cultural planning approaches. And paper seven, uh, 261 um, gives focus to alternate approaches to smart city initiatives in rural communities and a computational framework for facilitating particip participatory approaches um, in that context. And finally, um, another example, I guess, would be paper 403 that tackles um, responsive facade design and adopts um, a novel method for correlating biosignals um, as an interactive strategy to program uh, the behaviour of the facade or adaptive structure. Um, so what I'm going to do, we, we are, you know, we have a, quite a short session. I'm going to ask each of the panellists just to quickly introduce themselves, um, their name, affiliation uh, and paper title would be great. And um, I would invite you to, um, to our attendees to please post in questions. Hopefully you've had a chance to have a watch of the videos and also to any of our panellists. Um, you can post your questions in um, the Q&A section um, and uh, I will ask uh, the panellists these questions and the panellists themselves can obviously also ask questions directly. So um, we can just go down the list if I can start with, uh, is it Chuan Fei Yu with us today? No? Um, perhaps uh, we'll just start with Jeff because you're next to me on the screen if you'd like to introduce okay. yourself. Um, I'm Jeff Kim, my co-author is Mark Burry. We're both at the Smart Cities Research Institute at Swinburne University of Technology, Melbourne, Australia. And my paper, or our paper, is Encouraging Community Participation in Design Decision Making 
through reactive scripting, a general framework tested in the smart delivery context. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and uh, Mona. Oh, unmute. <laughs> You're still on mute. Uh, I'm Mona Gandhi, Assistant Professor of Architecture at Washington State University. I'm also the Director of Morphogenesis Lab that we are focusing on uh, cyber-physical adaptive uh, systems and uh, the role of biosignals and neurological signals in uh, forming our built environment. So our, my lab is an interdisciplinary lab uh, focusing on the integration of architecture, computer science, neuroscience, and uh, material science. Thanks, Mona. I, uh, I think oh, I, for, I have to t talk about the paper also. So my paper title is Reducing Energy Consumption Through Cyber-Physical Adaptive Spaces and Occupants Biosignal, paper 403. Thank you. Uh, Helena. Hello, all. My name is Hi. Helena Pino. I'm a junior researcher in INESC ID in Lisbon, and my paper is called From Macro to Micro an integrated algorithmic approach towards sustainable cities. Thank you, and Tom. Hello, I'm Tom Cavan. Uh, the paper's called Hope in Perturbanism. My co-authors, Justina Karakevich, Jose Rafael Holguin, and myself. Uh, I was with the University of Melbourne at the time I submitted the paper. I'm now with the Southern University of science and technology in Shenzhen, China. Thanks, Tom. And I think, uh, unmute, please. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Yi Ting. Um, Yi Ting Chong. I'm currently a PhD candidate in architecture and sustainable design pillar at Singapore University of Technology and Design. Um, my research is titled Sensing the Diversity of Social Hubs through social media data, which is part of my dissertation to explore the potential of geolocated social media in discovering the insights into our urban environment. Thanks. Okay, and Trevor. Hi, um, my name is Trevor Patz. I'm a uh, visiting professor at Carnegie Mellon University in the coming year. And my paper title is Spectral Clustering for Urban Networks. Thanks, Trevor. And Mohammed. hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, I am Mohamed Izzat, uh, German University in Cairo. I'm presenting a paper titled A Framework for a Comprehensive Conceptualization of Urban Constructs. It's about it's, uh, proposing a, a, a knowledge base that computation and the uh, uh, human user can uh, coexist uh, and uh, co cooperate uh, with each other over. It's a knowledge bit about, about Emma Corsons. Okay, thank you. And Jin Yua? Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, hello. hi. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Sassi Yu, and I'm uh, majoring in digital architecture in Nanjing University in China. And, and my uh, paper title is a machine learning based method for predicting urban land use. We established an artificial neural network model um, to, to try to study the correlations between the data of the target plot and its surrounding plots. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess, first of all, I think um, as I emailed to a couple of you today, I was curious to understand some papers are quite explicit in, um, or more explicit, I should say, in connecting to the theme, um, uh, the Kadria theme of the Anthropocene. Um, so I was wondering how um, all of you uh, position your work um, in relation to... I haven't sorry. Said, I haven't introduced ourselves yet. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Nobura, so sorry. <laughs> okay, so hey, everybody. And uh, I'm Noboru Kawagishi, an architect at the Mitsubishi Shoseki, and also the new student at the University of Tokyo. And uh, he's uh, uh, my research partner, uh, Kensuke Hota from the Keio University. And our title 
is under comparative study of urban virtual modeling platforms for urban planning and design practice. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, don't unmute. I'll start with you. Um, I'm, yours was a comparative study of uh, three different types of urban virtual modeling platforms. So I'm wondering um, in that study, I guess, how do you think uh, the move towards um, more integrated forms of, of modeling, I guess, relates to the theme of the Anthropocene and, and in terms of understanding um, our impact um, on the environment and per perhaps potentially mitigating our impact? How do you see these, um, these platforms as playing a role in that going forward? Actually, uh, we started this uh, research of these platforms because the, this, these kind of platforms have uh, certain potential to do all the collaborations or doing simulations and these uh, new types of design. So uh, the, from these reasons, actually, we have started. Uh, then actually we found was uh, actually the, all the CAD stuff, you know, uh, doing right now in local will be uh, online or so browser based. That is our sense after the, the, the research. And uh, with using these platforms, actually we, can, we have existing buildings online already, and you can, you can start sketching on it, and you can do simulations and uh, all the kind of CFD or heat simulations and so on, or already uh, browser-based. So this kind of things has, will be developing our kind of design process and I can be involved with other people, professionals, and also the clients and stakeholders. That is our the thinking from our research. Um, so you mentioned, uh, or you identified the significance um, of AI processes yes. um, as part of these platforms. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, actually, so, uh, with working on the browser-based platform, actually we have possibility of using this AI. And actually we tested one AI, uh, which is an artificial neural network and a CFD analysis. Mm. Uh, so that actually ba basically right now, when you run CFD simulations, it takes a lot of time and also yeah. a lot of simulations on PTs. Uh, but with using this uh, AI, actually you can, uh, you can get so somehow that analysis result within like one second for each option. So uh, that would be, that would make the kind of interactive of uh, all the professionals and also the stakeholders very quickly. So you can modify your shape on the platform and then you can get the result and the discussions. So you don't have to wait for the result. That mm -hmm. is very This could have, you know, potentially significant ramifications for uh, how architects undertake their design process with yes. presumably earlier ability to understand the implications um, of their design. Yeah, this is what, what we are thinking is still under development. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Helena, I'm going to move on to you because I think that the topics um, ha have some synergies in that um, I was, I found your uh, presentation very compelling because it was so clear um, Helena, for those who have not watched, you, it was the case study of the walkie-talkie building exactly. um, in London. And it, so the, the similarities I see between um, Noburu um, and Kanzuke's study and, and I guess yours uh, is that, again, you're talking about simulation tools that are able to foresee the negative impacts potentially um, of buildings or well, urban, uh, urban design as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about what motivated you to uh, undertake that research and where you might be taking it? I mean, the walkie-talkie is a case that I clearly remember hearing about on the news when I was a little younger. And what struck me about it was, uh, that it actually won a sustainability award prior to being constructed. And what we saw in the end was that it pretty much difficulted the life for the people that lived around that building for a while. And it resulted in um, a very costly uh, thing to fix. 
so to say. So the purpose of this paper was to look back and reflect upon known past mistakes, knowing that now we have strategies to prevent them and uh, to make those strategies easy to use and to uh, apply. That was great. Pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I think in this session, what I'm seeing um, from sort of not half the papers, but a third of the papers are really dealing with um, ways uh, modeling for simulation, so predicting potentially what will happen um, in the future. And then um, some of the other uh, research projects are dealing in a more real time data informing um, responsive environments. Uh, kind of sense, which is is um, a slightly different approach. Um, Tom, I was really interested in your paper um, picking up on these these threads that are running through each of these papers. Um, this notion you described uh, of investing in uncertainty um, and making small or disturbances in complex. Uh, adaptive systems and I, I wonder um, if you can talk um, a little bit about the work you've been doing. Uh, yeah, in, it was the Galapagos Islands is the case study. That's right, yes, we've been working in the Galapagos now for about five or six years to look at how the, the settlements there can better cohabit the islands with the natural mm -hmm. environment since there's no way to get rid of human settlements there now for political reasons. And the most uh, planning systems and most computational approaches are framed on a, an urban theory, which is based on certainty that we, if we lay things out in a particular way and fill things in, in a particular way, zoning being a popular one, then we are confident that the next steps are, are resolved. Uh, settlements there are mo more like informal settlements. They tend to evolve as people have money. And the second thing is that natural systems don't work on those levels of certainty. Natural systems do evolve and change. So we're looking, looking at the urban theories of uh, complex adaptive systems and trying to understand how urban settlements could change within that and how computational tools might assist people to explore the consequences and in CAS theory, it is about creating a disturbance to move the system on to the next stage. And so what are those in the urban context? I might point out, Nicole, if I could just, we've got two other people who joined us uh, after the introductions, uh, Ludovica and Peter, um, and they haven't had a chat just to make sure they're included. Yes, hello, I'm Ludovica. Hi. Can you see me? So I'm sorry, I initially like joined with, um, as an audience, probably following the link from the presentation. Ah. And then okay. I- Oh, hi, there you are, <laughs> sorry. Uh, hello, thanks, Tom. Would you like to introduce yourself, uh, Ludovica? Yes, so my name is Ludovica Tomarchio and I'm a PhD candidate also located in Singapore at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. And I also, my PhD is also within a research institute supported by ATH Zurich that is called Future Cities Lab. And my paper name is uh, Culture Smart City, Establishing New Data Informed Practice to Plan Culture in Cities. Where, as you mentioned before, I use social media data to inform cultural planning. And in this specific paper, I try to explore um, the relevance of my tools and uh, my uh, research into practitioners here in Singapore, for practitioners in Singapore. Yeah, so okay. thank you so much, Tom, for <laughs> noticing this. Thank you. I was just watching um, them come up here and I was also <laughs> trying to listen to what was being said and, uh, um, yeah, attention is being pulled in a few different uh, directions here. Um, thank you for that. I think um, if the... Uh, I might, I think I also have Peter, um, Portner. is he here? Are you here, Peter? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Apologies for joining late. I also made the same mistake as Ludovica. Oh, um, no, no, no problem. I could see you. I was just waiting for a moment to, um, to try and figure out what to do. Sure. So, but I think we're all here now and I'm not seeing any other people, um, 
waiting in the waiting in the hallway, so to speak, or in the lobby. Um, sorry, Tom, that sounds fascinating. Um, your project. Just wanted to quickly come back to you. What kinds of um, so you're you're talking about making small disturbances or or, or interventions in an existing urban system um, in the Galapagos. Um, I'm just wondering um, if you can quickly talk about um, your findings or, or well, the, the, the goal of the exercise was really to build a tool and a context to educate students to think right. differently about urban yeah. futures. And therefore, we um, started with the usual accessing of a large amount of data, both data which is available online in databases or through physical examination of the settlements, and then building a, a model for a set of tools, largely around um, cast theory and agent-based mo modeling, to give the students quick feedback as they were making choices, allowing them first to digest the data, yeah. and then to understand the implications of, of decisions they might be make and largely it resolved around uh, water access to water um, and access to food because those are two very damaging dimensions of human settlement since they de depend upon fossil fuels and uh, use of the land taking the land away from natural systems okay thank you um i'm just uh looking at where to go next. Um, does any, do any of the panel members have a question for any of the other panel members? This, this is like, I'm sure you're all teaching online at the moment and um, it, it's quite uh, challenging, I find, to often to elicit um, participation. Yes, please. Helena. Hi, uh, my question is for Mona. Uh, I was wondering, uh, have you considered any trade-offs between the goal of responding to users' emotions and the one of reducing energy consumption? Yeah, the main focus of the project, it includes the user's emotion at some point, but the main uh, reaction is towards the body temperature and the preferences that either it could be trained, you know, the built environment could be trained based on the preferences, so you can set it and you can have a individual user login and then you can set the environment based on what you want. Uh, but in addition to that, because all these physical, uh, you know, changes impacts our emotions. So when you feel too hot or too cold, you might feel aggressive or happy or, you know, uh, anxious. So there is a link between them. So that's why we cannot separate them from each other. Uh, but um, the whole idea is that rather than generic assumption of, um, the built environment to be set or to be performed as the specific standard that we can see either even in and, uh, um, a smart system integrating in our building even at this point, how we can adjust or how we can in real time uh, adjust the built environment uh, and the, let's say the access to the natural uh, ventilation or natural sun or light and so on and through the inner um, needs of the uh, occupants. So how the biological signals can automatically and autonomously impact the built environment without even us being informed of that. So if it detects that your body temperature is go, go up, so then it starts adjusting and through the natural ventilation, it can start moderating the, uh, the temperature of the space without using the energy, without using the AC or heater. So the whole purpose, and, and as you know, in the paper, it's just at this point is the full scale prototype, but not in the real life setting. So um, at this point, the whole concept was how we can use this adaptive system being integrated with uh, biological and neurological, system, neurological data using artificial intelligence and machine learning to uh, interact and have the real time dialogue between the body and the built environment and help the um, kind of the energy consumption, lower the energy consumption through this one-to-one uh, uh, -one interaction with the built environment. If I answer Thank your you. question, if there is any- Yes, you did, you did. Okay. Thank you. So Mona, I was really interested in your project. I teach urban interaction design um, as part of our computational design program at UNSW. 
and um, we're well aware of how difficult it is to make things move um, in the built environment in a really purposeful um, and deliberative way or in a, in a way at least that you intend and then um, uh, does not break. Um, I'm also super interested in that um, correlation between the bio signals and emotions and I'm just wondering uh, sort of how you think about the limitations of um, a heart rate correlating to a certain type of mood like if is it um, how reductive I guess is it to um, look at very specific human signals uh, whether it's uh, perspiration or um, echometrics um, brain signals and then decide that that means someone is happy when you know the, there's such a complexity of human emotion and human comfort is such a difficult uh, I, th I think one of the reasons why um, uh, you know HVAC systems or um, air conditioning systems never really work um, for everyone is because everyone has a different perception of, of what of what comfort is. So how do you reconcile? Uh, I know this is a proof of concept. So um, you you need for to establish those correlations. But what what's your thinking around that? I guess Actually, that's a very good question uh, because that's one of the challenges that we want to address. And uh, this is a project that has been around for three years. And one of the main focus was that how we can use the biosignal to detect the emotion. That was something that we had thousands of data gathered from different people, from different mm -hmm. race, from different genders, and accumulate all those data using different machine learning algorithms, compare those and come up with the ones that has the most uh, accuracy, which is a you know, combination of a couple of them uh, for the neurological part and uh, the one uh, decision tree, which was the most, uh, you know, accurate one uh, for the um, biological one. So it has been three years of studies of thousands of data with different group of people, computer scientists and so on, uh, so that eventually we can come up with the result of uh, having the algorithm that can use the biosignal and can detect your emotion. And as you can see in the presentation, we come up with the mobile uh, app for both iOS and Android. And it will be released very soon because it's almost there. And just for the mentoring mental health, let's say not necessarily related to architecture, the people can keep track of their emotions in, in per seconds and see um, how they feel and why it caused that feeling, how they can help themselves to moderate their uh, mental health um, and improve it. Uh, so that's one part that it has its own story to be able to detect that. But the other part, we started our way in a, in, in a way that we had some consultant with the psychologists, we had some consultant, you know, with the um, people in medical and, you know, biology, and to understand what those criteria means and what, are those, what those parameter means in the body and, uh, and how the changes in the built environment can help the people feel better as the, let's say, the um, standard, uh, starting point. So we start with the standard and those standard setting comes from the consultation from the people expert in those fields. For example, for the depression, it's proven, it's a lot of article out there, how uh, the natural light or natural ventilation can uh, help you heal or feel better. Or how the, each color, uh, what, what is the each color effect on the moods and feeling of the people when they are in, in space. So there are thousands of um, articles available and many research and studies has been around, around in, in this topic. So we start the, the uh, main setting with that. And for example, in the project that you can see in my background, we started with the very basic needs like that. When you feel hot, what do we mean? So there is a standard of, uh, for example, 60 Fahrenheit degree and then above it means hot, more than 80 means really hot. And so that was a very basic one and then how we can accommodate that. But the other important thing is that the generic assumption that we are addressing, we, we were aware of that shouldn't be the part if we as, assume that this level of opening can feel you, make you feel better, then we are doing the same generic assumption. So what we did, and I think it's part of the presentation is that you can log in 
and you can um, submit the preference, your preferences based on the changes in the built environment and it will be saved. And any time that you log in with your personal and individual information, then the built environment perform based on what you prefer. So the built environment behavior is different from your preferences than my preferences. And that happens through the individual login through the system. So there, there is a system in the cloud that you can log in with your username and password and you can change the built environment. And when you feel good, you can just click the sub confirmation button and that will be saved. So next time that you, your emotion detected or your body uh, biological signal detected on that level, automatically and autonomously the built environment change itself accordingly. Hmm. And so, that was given to the system through your preference. And so that's per individual. Yeah. Do you, um, how does your system cope with multiple people though? Uh, so, so that's something. Yeah. So if a if couple of people are in the system, so um, I mean, the thing that we are having and working at this time and definitely is not the perfect one is the average of uh, whatever is. Uh, submitted in the system. So if too many people are feeling hot, some people are feeling cold, there will be the average of the temperature mm. that can be, you know, good enough for both group. So yeah. it's, it, it's the I, I, the algorithm just get, get the average and, and perform according yeah. to that. I just worry that when we use these kind of systems that we satisfy no one because we it ends up, you know, um, being that average because it's a, a correlation, uh, the uh, amalgamation of so many people's data. So I think there's a lot of challenges going forward in how these systems are developed and um, how they balance um, all the data that's coming into them, how they make decisions about it. Yeah, what temperature and what opening is, is going to be actuated. Um, when it's aggregating potentially um, for, for building envelopes, yeah, it's um, aggregating so much data. So I think that's a really big challenge for smart environments. Um, it is, but what I think it's doing is that at this point we are dealing with this issue. So when you are working in commercial or the public spaces, there is a default setting. So either you like it or not. This one at this point, and we are trying to come up with a better uh, re result, but this one, it will be still generic, but this generic is a smart and is based on the real time collected data, not just the setting, you know, standard setting for whomever all around the world with the same situation. So it still be generic, but it will be more specific in its generic approach, I would say. It's one yeah. step further. And I think that's how AI can help us to be more specific towards the targeted population or occupant rather than just have the yeah. standard set for the whole, let's say US for, for the whole world or um, that generic assumption. Exactly. But yeah, that's a very, to... very, very yeah. the good challenge. And that's a very good question. And that's the real challenge yeah. that we are dealing with and we have to address it somehow. Absolutely, Mohammed, um, yes, I totally agree. Sorry, and I'm, I've got my eye on the time. Um, and I, I'm just, uh, yeah, it's a challenge to get to everyone. I just wanted to say, um, uh, can Suke put some, a question forward? And I didn't quite understand. UI between individual people and city can be replaced by scanning and artificial intelligence. Was that a question? Did you want to elaborate on that? I think we probably need to move on. Um, and then, yeah, we've, we do have 10 minutes to go. That's right. Um, uh, Mohammed, did you uh, have any questions or is there a particular aspect of your research um, that you would uh, like to talk about to raise it with the rest of the panel? Uh, the, goal, the goal of my research is uh, somehow to, to, to enable computation to aid the users, the stakeholders or the designers during the design process uh, to 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 uh, 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 motivate uh, and a creative design uh, environment. Uh, to do so, I introduced an ontology of urban constructs that states that uh, all the variants of urban constructs can be explored based on three perspectives alone. The three perspectives are labeled rational, visual, and emotional. 
uh, the, the ontology was published and it was translated into Italian. Uh, and somehow we can, can gain acceptance amongst the, the, the crowd of architects. And when I used the natural language uh, tools, I found the three perspectives are used in natural language actually to interpret the concepts. So I'm employing these three perspectives to understand from one hand the special features, the special environment as a feature, and from another, the concepts. I'm using the concepts to relate the features over, over, uh, over, over the concepts. I may share uh, some, uh, some slides of mine. So I'm actually the three perspective, one of which uh, the qualities of one of which the emotional, the emotional related to the sprawl and the spontaneous settlements. And based on the qualities of, of this environment, I have uh, uh, extracted most of the features related to how we can describe the activities of the buildings. Uh, as far as concerning the rational perspective, which is uh, uh, the theory behind this stuff is somehow elevated. I extracted the elements of, of architecture, the goal of any uh, building constructs, either to protect or to delimit, and amongst the other variations. And finally, the visual perspective uh, imposes the materialization, uh, including the color, the texture, the uh, composition of our different forms. And I came up with uh, a description of any urban construct based on a graph that allocate activities and this, the, the features of these activities are located over the graph. And over that graph, there can be allocated the, the uh, rational elements, which either protect or delimit. And finally, some the visual modifiers over this graph. So it's actually any urban concepts can be described as a labeled graph. This labeled graph can consequently be constructed using computational tools. Uh, and at the same time, the, the way computational tool can handle can handle uh, the structure of the graph can be done over. Uh, over the concepts that is commonly uh, that is driven from the user's conception, because I'm using natural language to link the, the features, the special features to uh, to these uh, to these features. For, for example, the, 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 there is a space of concepts related to uh, functionality. What what we mean by functionality? The rational perspective recognizes functionality as something usable, efficient, something functional and useful. While the emotional perspective uh, describes functionality as something systematic that is procedural, where the interaction between different agents uh, cause the existence of the, of the environment, the visual uh, perspective they, they describe functionality as ethical, as a product that is either expressive or formal, depending, that depends on certain characteristics and the techniques for generating the forms. The composition between these Perspective. These are extremes, of course. Each of one just is there to uh, to to to, uh, to aid the, the the mixing between these qualities to come up with concepts that can describe all the variants of urban constructs in a coherent way. The the features that I came up with, all of them split equally between either the emotional or the rational, because the environment can be described based on the activities and based on the protection level of the construct. The form itself is uh, itself can be distributed over. So the, the visual is, according to, to the ontology, is a modifier of the environment which exists based on the activities and based on the uh, on the uh, protection level. Uh, and based on that, I came up with a design process that uh, devises a designer because I want some help to mix. Uh, the, the, to, to discover the variations in a mixed in a mixed manner. Uh, the, I have the, a, is, hmm. Sorry, we've only got four minutes left. Yes. Um, thank you so much um, sure. for explaining that. I'm just wondering um, if uh, we can come back to the screen with the panelists. Um, if I can just try and quickly engage some of the other panelists um, in the discussion. Um, Trevor, I actually had a quick question for you. Um, the mapping uh, that you undertook in your research, and this relates a little bit to, um, I guess, what Mohammed uh, was just talking about, not so much in, in content, but 
Um, using these methods, uh, you talk about them having value, um, a potential value for designers. So how do we translate these rather complex um, map, mapping methods, uh, do you believe, into something that, um, you know, might be um, potentially usable um, in industry? What, I guess, yeah, what, what is the value of using your particular method, for instance? Yeah, I, I had a couple of ways that I came at the project itself. Um, but the main one was from previous work using um, multi-agent models, so using ran multi-agent random walks. And those, of course, have to be calculated in time uh, during a simulation. Um, and this was a way of kind of comparing that um, some of the, the proximity effects of that in a way that could be calculated beforehand or could be iterated over different changes uh, within, a, within a network. Um, within design, I thought it came up quite um, relevantly, particularly in informal urban contexts, um, where the kind of underlying pattern of the urban form was very difficult to maybe discern immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's maybe pointed at more in the presentation than in the paper um, because of the kind of direction that it came at, uh, direction that it developed. Um, that where I see it being more useful is actually a kind of fuzzy logic of it. So you're taking sort of the, um, the proximity scores of the clustering, but then maybe actually doing it over different types of um, different numbers of clusterings or different initial parameters and kind of superimposing them, overlaying them and getting a kind of confidence interval in terms of what is likely to be within a cluster over different types of initial parameters. Um, and this to me was useful for actually either uh, kind of from a de design point of view, either direction, whether it's identifying where there are maybe inherent neighborhoods or proximities, or ultimately looking at where there are boundaries um, or borders between one area and another where um, there's actually like large disconnects. And so as a designer, you might want to increase proximity, increase access, right. um, yep. or you may want to reinforce a kind of existing pattern at the urban scale, mm -hmm. um, or even smaller, I mean, it um, would work on like a large architectural master plan or campus type of scale equally. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I have so many more questions to you. I have been told that we can continue a little yeah. bit longer because we're going into a lunch break. So if you can hang in with me. Um, I had a question for Jeff. Um, I, I noticed in your paper that you describe how your modeling emphasizes behavior over data. And I was intrigued um, by the, the way that I guess, um, uh, that was phrased. Um, are the events not interpreted as as some form of data? Can you speak a little bit more uh, to the way that your framework uh, works in relation to Jeff's works um, on smart city initiatives in rural communities in India, um, yeah. if I've stated that correctly? Um, and you've developed quite a sophisticated uh, framework for enabling that. Um, and we've been talking a lot about data in this session and, and um, yeah, I'm just interested in that distinction between behaviour, um, detecting behaviour over data. Um, well, look, obviously at one level, as we're dealing with a computational program and bits and bytes, we are talking fundamentally about data in, in every aspect of the system. But um, what I mean when we talk about in our paper about prioritizing behavior um, over data is about the relationships that exist within the um, systems that we're looking at. So we're not trying to actually um, necessarily quantify exactly what we want to see in a simulation, but rather about um, the relationships that people prioritize between different elements and the weighting between those different elements. So um, part of this is um, in our modeling, we allow um, people to actually bring in their own priorities from outside the simulation. So we, um, as I said in our presentation and paper, we do use um, an aspect of gamification within the simulation we create, but gamification in probably the most typically used sense has um, 
a very prescriptive set of goals and uh, um, you know rewards and points and challenges and in quests to motivate people to engage. Uh, we're not trying to do that within our system. We're trying to actually provide a way for people to bring the social context of their communities into the simulation and then start to prioritize what um, what is actually important. And in our proof of concept, um, we provided two modes that perhaps give a, a, an example that helps make that a bit more concrete in one's mind. Um, one example is, um, or mode of operation for the proof of concept was how to establish community Wi-Fi networks within these remote villages that are often quite isolated from seats of government. And uh, so people can actually start to say um, within their social context, what are the factors that are controlling where these Wi-Fi nodes should be? Uh, within our proof of concept, there's um, embodied expert knowledge, which we actually use as a as a genetic algorithm that will help people place where nodes, Wi-Fi nodes should be. But it's really the up to the people using the tool, the villagers themselves to say, well, look, um, this is an important location within the village. This is, um, you know, the, these people live in this area. Um, with our limited budget, we need to prioritize these particular parts of the village. And maybe these other areas are less important. Thank you. I, I think that's um, incredibly important. I think that the smart city, uh, you know, um, as, as a concept um, tends to be um, certainly in larger cities, top down um, driven, and um, it doesn't or hasn't typically accounted um, for citizens and individual perspectives or experiences um, mm. very well in the way it's implemented in a very sort of technocratic um, way often sponsored obviously by large um, tech companies and um, often framed um, really a, a, um, as a competitive measure um, mm -hmm. for cities. So to um, develop ways to engage uh, citizens um, or uh, local people um, in that process and enable, I, I, I guess you're giving them more agency Yes, Jeff, certainly. would you describe it that way? Yeah. Yes, certainly. And I think you make a very good point, Nicole. Um, I think, um, and look, this isn't um, necessarily a blanket um, approach to smart cities, but I think within smart cities and regions, there's too often a thread of, of being about centres rather than citizens and people. Uh, often it feels like the citizen has ended up um, being the observed rather than the observer yeah. in the system. Yeah. And you know, it really should be the citizen who's driving these things. And I yeah. think of that as being a um, uh, really a kind of a cellulose over a, a silicon model. It's taking sort of a traditional conservative paper-based approach to what people think and looking at static studies and surveys instead of thinking about how can we really involve them as um, you know, uh, uh, integrated agents in this digital decision-making with a more rapid mm. feedback loop. And then we have to, I mean, and what's interesting about um, your work is how you balance that um, local knowledge with actually expertise and a, and a, and a better understanding of how these systems um, will be best implemented with, yeah, what, what uh, ha, yeah, balance with the local needs. I think that's very tricky. And we, we have really talked about um, uh, the themes around these issues in quite a few of the presentations today. And, um, uh, in, in regard to Mona's, like how you prioritise data, how you, um, the, the inputs coming into the system, um, how are they treated and organised and, and the hierarchy and, and, and what does that mean for the, for the outputs going, um, for, for the actuation, for what actually um, happens. Really interesting questions around data. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question to the uh, two um, I think it was Eating and Ludovica, I think. Um, sorry, Peter, I know I was fascinated by your paper and I, I do want to ask you a question, so I'll try and ask this really, qu really quickly. We're talking about data. I'm fascinated with data ethics. Um, I'm really interested in the way we work with uh, social media data um, any uh, any data that we you know can draw from the environment really and how we build that into workflows, and I just wonder particularly um, uh, eat I think it was eating how you know have you thought about the limitations of 
Twitter data, for instance? Um, and how do you deal with that in your research uh, where you're trying to account for concepts such as diversity um, when uh, the Twitter user profile, you, you know, is, is quite um, limited itself, um, you know, tends to be people in the 30 to 45 year old range. I don't know what the Twitter profile for Singapore is um, specifically, but um, overall, um, you know, not everyone is on Twitter, not everyone contributes to that data. So um, when you're looking at a very specific pool of data, uh, yeah, how do you account for the, the limitations um, in what it can possibly tell you if it can only capture a very small um, profile of, of uh, people? Hi, um, thank you for the question. I've been getting these questions a lot, actually, <laughs> regarding my research. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I mean, there's a fundamental biases to big data, especially social media data. And we all know the shortcomings of um, the profiles of the data are not comprehensive. Uh, but uh, looking back at um, urban spaces, because I'm trying to link uh, social media data Geo, especially geolocated social media data that has uh, the lead and loans to tell us where people has been. And th these connections are invaluable, even though we would not be, uh, if we look at the traditional way of understanding urban spaces, we are observing people, we are going on surveys, the data samples are much, much smaller than what we yeah, can have right. from the yeah. data, uh, tweet data. So even though uh, the, the uh, spectrum of uh, social media data is not that great, uh, but it still captures the uh, granularity of time and space. For example, we can look at various different public spaces at the same time, at the same time frame, um, and also look at uh, public spaces, uh, how they've been used and how being occupied over many years, which is not, yeah. which is impossible for a traditional way of uh, looking at or analyzing these spaces. So I think that makes up the shortcomings. So while we are doing the research, I think we are very cautious about these uh, uh, biases. So uh, we have uh, been um, numerous times trying to uh, validate our findings, contextualize it with the current conditions. For example, I will plot or visualize the findings of diversity and density and look at the current urban conditions and see if it, you know, if it makes sense. And we actually was able to find that um, the findings are cor corresponding quite accurately with what's going on right now, yeah. which then would kind of give us the foundation or, or confidence that we will be able to um, uh, sort of understand the, the, the other spaces based on this um, same method. And using big data, actually, uh, th the way that I'm trying to frame it, it's, it's a really simple, simple way of quantifying quite intangible quality of diversity because we were not able to really quantify what diversity is. But by looking, what I'm proposing here is a very simple and quick way, which could be uh, used as a sort of preliminary uh, understanding of the yeah. overall social landscape. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to have to call time there. I'm getting a lot of pressure from the Kadria people to uh, uh, bring this to a close. Um, I do want to encourage everyone to read Peter's paper <laughs> um, and look at Peter's presentation. I found it fascinating. It uh, urban air mobility, we don't think enough about the future. And I think really conceptualizing uh, drone corridors and understanding the impact, especially in our COVID situation where we can imagine that, um, you know, drone deliveries in the future might be the way to go. Um, so apologies, Peter, I didn't get to ask you a specific question, um, but I'm encouraging you all to join the spatial chat forum eight uh, to talk to each other um, and ask any questions that unfortunately um, I, I wasn't able to facilitate today. Um, I really enjoyed uh, reading and listening to um, all of your presentations and uh, I hope that um, I can actually meet you physically um, in the flesh at some time in, in the future, possibly in Hong Kong um, or wherever um, the next cadrea is in, in the coming years. So um, really thank you very much and apologies if I didn't get to talk uh, if, if I didn't get to ask you a question. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.